Uh, there we go. So um, I have a brief message that I've prepared and uh, just want us to, to think about this. So Sue and I returned to Indianapolis just yesterday from our vacation. We came back to a city, a state, and a country which is much different than the one that we left two weeks ago. While we were traveling, we were watching the news, whatever news we could find that was in English, and there wasn't a lot, so that we could follow what the events were that were taking place at home and around the world. It was a surreal experience to each day learn of more nations that were closing their borders of the number of COVID-19 cases increasing everywhere around the world, particularly in Europe. And most tragic to hear of the growing number of deaths related to this new and previously unknown virus. We are living in unprecedented times. What is happening in the world today has never happened in history. When you think of it, nearly every nation on earth has simultaneously shut their borders. They put billions of people in quarantine and nearly stopped all travel and face-to-face -face social interaction. There are millions of children who are out of school, many of whom will have lost a half year of their formal education. Stores are running out of food and cleaning supplies and other essential items. In fact, Sue and I were given uh, forewarning before we left Turkey and we brought, bought, we bought a separate bag just to put toilet paper in and we brought it back for Catherine and her family so my kids can legitimately get a t-shirt printed that says, my parents went all the way to Turkey and all they brought me back was a roll of toilet paper. This, the closest that the world has probably ever seen like this, uh, a situation like this would have been World War II, in which many parts of the world lived in fear of being bombed or of armies marching through their cities. Food was rationed and all types of common consumer items were not available so that the raw materials could be used to make weapons for the war effort. Now, of course, what is happening now, at least at this point, is nowhere near as devastating as the Second World War. But the similarity comes in the kinds of adjustments and sacrifices that people are being asked to make to avoid the potential of millions of worldwide deaths. What we are grappling with at this time in history is more about the fear of the unknown than anything else. We are not sure what this coronavirus is. Is it just another form of, of a cold or a flu? Or is it something more deadly? No doubt you've all heard the statistics that are out there. LiveScience.com on March 18th printed the following or published the following. So far, the new coronavirus has led to more than 220 illnesses and more than 9,300 deaths worldwide. But that's nothing compared with the flu, also called influenza. In the US alone, the flu has caused an estimated 36 million Ill illnesses 370,000 hospitalizations and 22,000 deaths this season, according to the Center for Disease Control. That said, scientists have studied seasonal flu for decades. So despite the danger of it, we know a lot about flu viruses and what to expect each season. In contrast, very little is known about the new coronavirus and the disease it causes, dubbed COVID-19, because it's so new. This means COVID-19 is something of a wild card in terms of how it will spread and how many deaths it will cause. The article goes on to point out that the mortality rate, the number of people who die or the percentage of people who die from the flu is about 0.1%. Whereas the mortality rate for the COVID-19 illness ranges anywhere from 0.6% on the lowest estimates to 3% or even higher in some countries. Therefore, the COVID-19 disease has the potential to kill between six and 30 times more people than the flu if it were to be as widespread as that common illness is. What we don't know is how many hidden cases of the disease are out there and how many people thought they may have had just an ordinary flu and, or may not have had any symptoms at all, but in fact did have the COVID-19. Until there is some idea of that number, of the number of total cases, 
We are dealing with the unknown, and that is why we have such fear, anxiety, and panic. Again, because of the unknown potential of this disease to kill people, public health officials are forced to assume worst case scenarios. And thus the draconian measures that have been put in place and the unpleasant realities that we are all dealing with. When this is over, and it will be over, many of those questions will be answered. There will be leaders and governments all over the world that are going to be held to account because of their action or lack of action. There will be plenty of excuse making, finger pointing and playing of the blame game when all of this is, is finished. However, now is not the time for any of that. At this time, we need to follow the instructions that we are given, keep our distance, stay at home when possible, go out in public as little as possible, and do everything we can to prevent the spread of this disease. As Christians and followers of the God of the universe, we have a hope and a power to look to and a comforter to lean upon that the rest of the world does not have. We must remember that when we hear of the fear and the panic which millions around the world are experiencing, that they are not looking to the power of the Almighty God and they do not have the presence of the Holy Spirit within them to give them comfort. I'm going to look briefly at five passages of, passages of Scripture which speak to us directly in this situation and situations similar to this. Two of the passages come from the Old Testament prophets, one from our Lord Jesus Christ and one from the Apostle Paul. And then we will conclude with a reading of a very relevant psalm, scripture uh, in the Psalms. Now I'm going to share my screen again. In November, I preached a message on the book of Habakkuk, and I referred to this passage. Back then, the situation which Habakkuk describes was only hypothetical, as something that might take place. Today, as we look at empty shelves on the grocery stores, it describes a very real situation. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet and he will make me walk on high hills. If you remember from that message back in November, the book of Habakkuk is actually a discussion between the prophet and the Lord God. Habakkuk could not understand why God allowed evil and injustice to go unrestrained among God's chosen people, the Israelites. The Lord answered that he was going to send the Babylonians to bring justice upon that disobedient nation. Now that prophecy was fulfilled very soon after it was revealed to Habakkuk perhaps even in his own lifetime. Habakkuk may very well have experienced what he actually described in those words, in those passages. Also in the book of Habakkuk, he was given a prophecy about the time of the great tribulation in which wrath and judgment will be poured on all the earth. And the circumstances will again be very similar to those that are described in these verses. Habakkuk understood that when all was lost, he needed to look to God for sustenance, both physically and spiritually. God would be his strength. The picture that, that Habakkuk paints in verse 19 is that of a deer that prances and runs around the steep and treacherous hills of Judea. It's a desolate and dangerous place, and yet these deer are able to thrive in that environment. God has given them the, the resilience in that environment, and the deer are able to live their lives fully and completely, even in the most harsh circumstances. We, too, can thrive and be resilient in times of difficulty if we look to the Lord for our strength. A second passage 
that we're going to look at today comes from the book of Daniel, from a story that most of us are very familiar with. It is that of the three young Hebrew men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor of Babylon, was encouraged by his treacherous advisors to set up a golden idol and demand that everyone bow down to it. Now, those advisors knew that those three Jewish men, who also held high positions in the emperor's court, would never bow down to that image. They forced the emperor's hand, and so he had to punish the three Jews according to the orders that he had made, which was that they would be thrown into a burning furnace. We know that the three men were thrown into the furnace and that they were saved by the Lord himself. Their hair was not singed. They didn't even smell of smoke. However, what is so striking about this story is the words they said to Nebuchadnezzar before he had them thrown into the furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you set up. Those three men of God would not cease serving the Lord, even though they're, they may not have been delivered from destruction. We must keep that same perspective. We are all going to see some kind of trouble and serious problems in our life. It may not be this coronavirus. It may be something else. However, we need to keep the perspective of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Even if we are not delivered from whatever tragedy may come our way, we will never bow down to fear and panic. We know that the Lord is in control and we must continue to put our trust in him. A third passage, which we can look to for guidance at this time, is the prayer of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on the night before his crucifixion. We're all familiar with this scene. He and his disciples climbed the Mount of Olives and were in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Lord went alone and he agonized in prayer to the Father. He prayed that the cup of suffering, which he was going to have to drink from, could be taken away. And he was withdrawn from his throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. We don't know exactly why the Lord prayed that prayer. He was aware that it was his destiny to come to earth to die. That's why he came here in the first place. Perhaps the burden of bearing the penalty for the sin of all of mankind was just too much for his human nature. I've heard it suggested that it was not the death and the suffering that he was asking to be taken away, but the rejection of his own people. That when the Jews, God's chosen people, sent him to the cross, he was praying that that rejection was what God would take away. Whatever the reason for the prayer, we know that the Lord Jesus was in great agony, but he still desired that God's will would be accomplished. We as believers need to trust the will of God, even in times of uncertainty, certainty, such as what we face today. Romans 8.28 tells us that all things work together for the good of those who love Jesus and are called according to his purpose. We need to believe with all our heart that God's will is always the best, even if it seems hard at times, like it does at this time. We know that we will be brought through any difficulty and we will emerge victorious with a deeper and a greater love for the Lord. A fourth passage I want us to consider is a favorite of many. It comes from the fourth chapter of Philippians. Now, while there are many wonderful verses in that chapter, I want to fo focus on some that speak directly to the kind of situation we are in today. Paul says in Philippians 4, 11 to 13, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. 
Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to, be a, to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When Paul wrote these words, he was under house arrest. Just like most of us today, he was not allowed by the government to leave his residence. He was kept there as a prisoner because he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in a pagan empire. He could not come and go as he wished. He could not earn money, just like many of us today. He was dependent on the generosity of the believers to whom he had ministered over many years. Just when he most needed financial help, the Lord provided for him by moving the believers in the church of Philippi about a thousand miles away to send him a gift. Out of gratitude, Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians, and he said that he had learned, however, in whatever search situation he was, to be content. And he knew what it meant to have plenty. He had been in situations where he had more than what he needed and times when he had very little. He had experienced abundance and poverty. Yet he had learned the secret of contentment in whatever situation he found himself. That secret was to trust in the Lord and to rely upon him alone. With that contentment, he said that he could do anything that God required him to do because he found his strength in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we too should learn the secret of that contentment. Now these are hard times for all of us. And we're all suffering in, in one way or another. The losses that many of us have experienced in our retirement account, accounts due to the drop in value of the stock market is devastating. We don't know when and if it's going to recover. We are living in the fear of the unknown. What new restrictions are we going to find out tomorrow or next week or next month? We don't know. In conclusion, I want to remind us that now is not the time to criticize and to find fault. There will be plenty of evaluation and commentary on this situation after it's over. In the meantime, we need to cooperate with the public health guidelines that we are given and to do our best to contain the spread of this disease. We learned today, like Habakkuk, that when the store shelves are empty, we still find hope and strength in the Lord. We saw the example of the three Hebrew young men, that even if disaster strikes, we should never stop serving and praising the Lord. The Lord Jesus gave us the example of trusting the will of God, even when suffering and turmoil are certain. Paul showed us how to be content in all circumstances, because whatever we are called to do, we can do it through Jesus Christ, who gives us strength. Now, these are not just trite cliches. This is solid truth based on the promises found in God's word. Let us look to the Lord and rely upon him. Let us be the body of Christ. Let's make ourselves available to help in whatever way we can to ease the difficulty and the suffering that we may see around us. If there's anything you can do to help your neighbor, your friend, someone else in church or a stranger, please do that. Reach out and be the body of Christ at this time. In closing, I have asked Patrick to read Psalm 46. This psalm is speaking of the time of the great tribulation and how all believers are going to have to look to the Lord during those circumstances. Now, we are not going to go through anything close to what will happen at that time, but these words will give us hope and encouragement during all these times of difficulty. I'm going to share the screen again, and then Patrick, when you're given the microphone, if you could please read this for us. Good morning. Um, I want to second pastors uh, uh, thanks for the technology, uh, the people who have worked on the technology to make this come to pass. Um, so that you can hear, I hope you can all hear this. Um, Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. 
even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is, is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Thank you, Patrick. And again, I'm going to uh, ask Mark to unmute um, everyone. Uh, however, if you're if you're um, at your home and you uh, please don't talk unless you're going to be talking into the microphone. You can, if you're on a computer or a smartphone, mute your mute your microphone. 